This video is about solving quadratic equations, and for our notes we'll recall several methods there are to do this, uh, and we'll see examples of each of these methods. We have the square root property, factoring, completing the square, which will naturally lead us right into the quadratic formula. Let's take a look at this first example where we want to solve the equation as follows. 5x plus 1 is in parentheses all squared plus 3 equals 10. One thing to observe about this problem, the way it's set up, is that x, the variable, is buried within the parentheses that have the power of 2 outside of them. So <clears throat> we have to unlock that x in order to get it alone and eventually solve it. That's a hint that we may be wanting to get rid of this squared in order to free up the x, but to get rid of the squared, we have to use what's called the square root property. So in this case, we'll first isolate the squared term by subtracting 3 from both sides. That'll give us 5x plus 1 all squared equals now 7. Then we'll unsquare by taking the square root. Of course, we have to do it to the entire of both sides. This will give us 5x plus 1 on the left, and then plus or minus the square root of 7 on the right. The plus or minus has to be there. It's easy to forget that uh, for reasons that we'll see in other kinds of equations when we get there. But for now, <clears throat> we have this where we can finally get x alone by subtracting 1. That'd give us 5x equals negative 1 plus or minus root 7. And then if we divide by 5 on both sides, we'll end up with uh, x equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 7 all over 5. Now since these terms in the numerator, namely the negative 1 and the root 7, uh, cannot be combined because they're not like radicals, uh, we can't go any further than this, and nothing will reduce or, or factor, so we'll just stop right here. Let's look at another example where we want to solve. This time the equation is 2x squared plus 7x plus 3 equals 0. We'll notice the quadratic form and that it's different from our first example in that there is no um, x that's buried in parentheses squared. This time it's just an x squared showing up as part of this trinomial. So in a case like this, sometimes a good way to check um, for a method is to see if it's factorable. And one good way to check on that is to try uh, just like a first step of what might be called a product sum or AC method. Um, if this works, that's a hint that it's factorable. You could get the product by multiplying the first term times the third term. That's like the A times the C. That's 6. And then the sum is just the middle term, so positive 7. If you can find two, two numbers that have this sum and this product, that's a good sign. In this case, it does work as 6 and 1. Now that simply tells us that it is factorable. To do the factoring, there are various methods, but it turns out maybe a guess and check or something like it would be just fine for this one. We'll know, we know we're going to factor this into a product of binomials. And if the first term is 2x squared, we should put or try a 2x times an x. But that leaves us with very limited options, which is good. For our last term, um, to get 3, that means I have to have either a plus 1, plus 3, or a minus 1, minus 3 in these blank remaining spots. But to get the middle term of 7x, it turns out I should probably put the plus 3 here, so that outer times outer would be plus 6x, and then plus 1 here, so that inner times inner would be plus 1 which will eventually get us what we need. And then the zero product property at this point will tell us to set each of these factors to zero. That means 2x plus 1 equals zero, or x plus 3 equals zero, and we'll solve each for x, giving us finally x equals negative 1 half, or x equals negative 3. And so these are the two solutions that we get for this quadratic equation. Let's try a third example. This time, the example directions say find all real solutions. Okay, we'll talk about what that might mean. But then it also gives us this specific method to use. It says by completing the square. 
Now there are several steps to it and we'll review them in this example. The first step is to move the C value to the other side of the equation away from the X's. So in that case, this would turn into X squared plus 3X equals 7 fourths. Uh, next, or actually interchangeably with that first step, would be to divide everything by the leading coefficient of the squared variable if it's not 1. But it is 1 because you don't see anything there. So there's nothing to do in that step, otherwise we would. And then after that, we have to do this step where we have to add b over 2 squared to both sides. Now, in this case, we're talking about the b value being this middle or second coefficient, in this case 3. So if I plug that in for b, this really means 3 over 2 squared, which of course is 9 fourths. We're going to add that to both sides, which will end us up with x squared plus 3x plus 9 fourths. So I'm adding it to the left side of the equation. But I'm also going to add it to the right side, where there already was a 7 fourths. So we'll now say plus 9 fourths as well. Then the next step is the magic step of realizing that we finally have created a square on the left side. Now it may not be obvious, but that is a perfect square which can be factored. Uh, and if you don't remember the formula for factoring a perfect square, there's a little bit of a shortcut to it. And that is this, we're going to put the variable in the front. And then whatever we had before we squared it as b over 2, so in this case the 3 over 2, we're just going to drag that over, including its sign, and put it right here after the x. This is the shortcut to factoring the completing the square. That number always goes there. And then on the right side, we're going to combine like terms. 7 fourths plus 9 fourths would be 16 fourths. Now, <clears throat> we're kind of where we were at the first problem in this set, where we use the square root property to unsquare both sides. This will give us x plus 3 halves equals plus or minus, don't forget it, 4 over 2. That's the square root of 16 over the square root of 4. Of course, that's reducible, so we should reduce it. Uh, this means x equals, if I subtract the 3 halves, negative 3 halves plus or minus 4 halves. Now, I'm going to leave it unreduced until the next step, which is I'm going to combine these and get two different options for our solutions. So one option is the negative 3 halves plus 4 halves. The other option is the negative 3 halves minus 4 halves. The plus or minus causes two different possibilities. Of course, when we simplify these, uh, we'll end up with 1 half as the first option. Negative 3 plus 4 halves is 1 half. Or the second option, negative 3 minus 4 halves would be uh, minus 7 halves. And there we have our two solutions found by completing the square. Let's look at another example where we want to find all real solutions. And in this case, the method to use is not specified. So let's explore this a little bit. As we saw previously already, this is not a good setup for the square root property because we do not have some kind of parentheses with our x squared in them uh, as we saw in our first example. So rather than that method, we could, we could consider factoring. In this case, we could try maybe using some kind of factoring method for a trinomial. Uh, pick your favorite method out there. In this case, let's try it. We could have a 3x and an x. And then we'd have to have a plus 1 and a minus 1 here and here to get that last term, but mm, that doesn't look good. There's no combination of plus 1 or minus 1 I could put there that when I check it with foiling would give me the middle term, which means factoring is not going to work either. Well, when factoring does not work, completing the square does. So let's, again, try to complete the square to solve this quadratic and we'll review all the steps start to finish. The first step is to get the c value uh, assuming that we are in the 
ax squared plus bx plus c format. We want c to the other side, so that'll give us 3x squared minus 6x equals 1. Then we want to divide by a if it's not 1, and it's not here. That means we want to divide everything by 3 all the way down. That'll give us x squared minus 2x equals 1 third, and this should look a little familiar from where the last problem started. We'll then add our special b over 2 squared to both sides. Now in this case, b is this middle coefficient of negative 2, so that's really negative 2 over 2 squared which is really negative 1 squared, which is 1. So I just want to add 1 to both sides. That'll give me x squared minus 2x plus 1 equals 1 third plus 1. Now we want to continue by factoring our perfect square that we've created. We can use the shortcut, which is put the variable in front, find whatever b over 2 was before you squared it. That's up here, this negative 1. So we'll throw that in its place so that we have x minus 1 squared. And then on the right side, we have 1 third plus 1. I really want to combine those with a common denominator. So since 1 would be 3 thirds, we'll call that altogether 4 thirds. Then we'll unsquare, or in other words, square root both sides. This will give us x minus 1 equals plus or minus 2 over the square root of 3. Now to get x alone, of course, we'll add 1 to both sides and end up with x equals 1 plus or minus 2 over the square root of 3. Now technically we're done because x is alone, but it's often the case that you wouldn't see an answer written in this form. Uh, rather, you might see it rationalized. Rationalizing a single term denominator would involve multiplying by the exact root we have and want to get rid of square root of 3 over itself, a convenient form of 1. And we can do that only with the second term because we're just multiplying by 1. This gives us a result of x equals 1 plus or minus, and then they would give us 2 root 3 in the numerator over 3 in the denominator, root 3 times root 3 is 3. So you could stop here, or sometimes, depending on the textbook author, uh, they will actually go further and get a common denominator calling this 3 plus or minus 2 root 3 all over 3, but either one uh, should be acceptable. So in our next and last example for this topic, we're going to find all real solutions by the quadratic formula. And so we'll bring that into play. Um, we have to identify what a, b, and c are. They're 7, negative 2, and 4. And so using the formula, which yes, you do have to have memorized, it should equal x, uh, or x should equal negative b. Now that's actually negative negative 2, since b is already negative. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, always put that in parentheses, mm -hmm. minus 4 times a times c, and that's all over 2 times a. Now we'll just simplify. This becomes 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 112 all over 14. All right, we'll keep this simplifying. This becomes 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 108 all over 14. Now we'll want to reduce further. We'll keep this 2 out front, but then notice and recall when you have a negative sign inside a square root, that becomes an imaginary uh, term, and so this becomes i times the square root of 108. And that's all over 14. If we reduce the square root, we'll end up with 2 plus or minus, uh, let's see, this is i times the square root of 108, could be written as 36 times 3, 
and that will help us reduce the root. Of course, this is all still over 14, which means this is 2 plus or minus. Um, the square root of 36 is 6, so we'll call this 6i. Square root of 3, all over 14. But then we'll look to see that these three numbers are reducible. They're all divisible by 2. It's an all or nothing deal on this reducing. You could divide them each by 2. Uh, and to do so would give us 1 plus or minus 3i square root of 3 all over 7. Now because we have an i in this result, it would mean that these solutions are not real, but they are imaginary. So when you see problems that say find all solutions, all, all solutions could include an imaginary solution, which would be these, but they would not be a real solution.